Good evening, all, and welcome to this meeting of the Board of Education of Regional School District 12. Call this meeting to order at 7.30, 8. Uh, Lisa, you want to call attendance? Okay. Joe? John? Here. Greg? Here. Angela? Here. Alex? Here. Justin? Here. Jen? Here. I'm here. Jane? Julie? Peter? And Mary? Okay, we're all here. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this point, is there any public comment on matters on the agenda? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, there are three sets of minutes. The Board of Education meeting of February 28, 2022. Does anyone want to take that off the consent agenda to amend it or do something else with it? I don't hear anyone. There's the meeting minutes of March 7, 2022. Does anyone want to take that off the consent agenda? I hear nothing. Um, the meeting of March 7, 2022. So that was the that was the general meeting. First we had the special meeting. This is the, the, the general meeting on that day. Does anyone want to take those minutes off the consent agenda? <clears throat> Hearing none, the uh, three sets of minutes will be adopted. And we will now ask the superintendent to provide us with updates on COVID-19. Okay. Um Good evening, everyone. Um, and I want to make certain that I'm sharing the information that is of most interest to everybody, which is how are we doing week by week at this point with our COVID numbers? And rather than walking you through and doing the in totality what's happening with our numbers, I'm just going to direct everybody to our website. And on our website, when you go to the Region 12 website under COVID, First thing that you're going to see is you're going to see the Region 12 COVID numbers. And we have it broken down week by week. So this past week, we had one case of COVID. The week prior, we had one case of COVID. The week before that, four cases. So especially as now we have changed our masking requirements requirement to be a masking recommended, we want to make certain that we're not hiding the numbers in what's happening. Um, I can share that at this point, our students have been remarkable about honoring people's decisions, whether they are masked or unmasked. Um, I can also share with you, when we first made the recommendation and not a requirement, we started with about 40% of the students. We watched it go to about 30%. We've watched it drop to 20%. I would say now we have about 10% of our students. Um, currently, I can tell you, I am personally wearing a mask. Uh, my own decision, my daughter is gonna be going in for surgery, but that's exactly the things that we want people to feel comfortable making those decisions on what's healthiest for your family and what you need to do. But by making certain that people have access to that information, you also know the infection rates in our district and at, at what point um, we see any spread start to tick up again. I can share uh, that we are being very purposeful in our event planning. There are no big events that are happening the week after April vacation. We do see that at that week returning, and this has been for the past two years of COVID, we tend to see more infection within the school. Region 12 continues to contact trace, which means we are watching for any exposures that happen. We are also noting if the people are masked. So we're having those conversations that it's not that COVID has just gone away. We continue to watch. We're watching for if there's a difference now that it is a recommendation to mask. At this point, um, I can say that people are functioning. I can also say it's a different 
feeling for our students in the classrooms, um, there's a comfort level. And whether they're comfortable with masks on or with masks off, um, you're seeing students comfortable in their learning environment. And so right now we also see it's safe to allow that decision to continue, but we will continue to monitor for that. So at this point, are there any questions with the COVID-19 update? But I can tell you it's, it's a non-remarkable update. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go on to the reports and recognition. We'll start with my report. I just have just a couple of brief comments to make. The first thing I wanna do is circle back to the beginning of the meeting because I was not very good. I forgot to say this was a, uh, I was calling to the attention of the Board of Education regular meeting. There were two items that were supposed to be here tonight. Uh, there, was a, there was a public hearing on the budget and then there was a, a meeting, a special meeting to deal with it. And both of those were canceled as you know. But I just want the record to reflect that those were canceled. There were issues related to the notice of the meeting and we decided for a variety of reasons that it made more sense to re-notice it uh, for next Monday because we have a meeting next Monday. So we will be having the district public hearing on the budget as well as that on Monday. I wanna make it clear uh, for everyone that's out there that even though the district meeting and public hearing is scheduled between the hour of seven and 7.15, if there are people that have comments and they run it past, we will be here until they're done. Uh, so I just wanna be, make that, we're not limiting it to, to, to a 15 minute period of time. It's, it's whatever, the only thing is, is that in, in many, many recent years, we've had less than 15 minutes of comments. So we, we schedule them arbitrarily and we extend them as necessary to accommodate public input. We welcome public input, we welcome questions, and we will answer those questions as they're, probably as they're asked, depending on how it, it lays out and what types of questions are, are asked. Uh, and so that, that's what we will be doing next, uh, next week. Um, and I think that's more or less what I had. Uh, good, we'll move on to the treasurer's report, John. Microphone, please. You're going to need them both. <laughs> there, there we are. Oh, sorry. My report is is more or less an introduction to the uh, the, the agenda item tonight concerning the audit, the 2020-2021 uh, 2020, budget audit uh, performed by Charles Heaven. And um, on March 21st, at the uh, Facilities and Operations Committee meeting, uh, Erica Miloragno uh, presented the Independent Auditor's Report for the year ended June 30th, 2021. It uh, is quite a le lengthy document, uh, 63 pages, and it covers uh, many categories. A lot of it is repetitive, but um, it, it, if you really um, look at it, um, a lot of it um, pertains to um, things like the financial analysis of district as a whole, district's net position, including assets, liabilities, and total net position, uh, capital assets, that's our land, our buildings, and our Fixture, furniture fixtures and equipment, um, which totals $32,537,000 in uh, $537,363. Uh, it, mentioned, it mentions uh, our long-term debt, uh, changes in position uh, attributed to the increase, uh, mostly by the increase in tuition income, uh, the operational grants, including grant monies from our state um, and federal dollars, uh, COVID-related grants uh, that were received um, prior to June were um, $314,812. And there is an additional uh, $342,269 which will be um, uh, given uh, 
in the ongoing recovery support through 2023. Uh, it also met, covers the um, non-certified employee retirement plan, which um, I think I've mentioned before, it's, it's in excellent shape. It's 112% funded, which there are not many punch, pension plans, plans that are that healthy. Uh, it also mentions the state teachers pension fund, which is not in good shape, but that um, that uh, part of the of the of the uh, of the um, audit covers 12 pages, and um, it also mentioned the monies going back to the three towns. That is the fund balance as of June uh, 2021. And that was $812,352. Okay, so the, um, at the end, toward the end of the document, um, it, um, they, Charles Heaven um, concludes that the audit did not identify any deficiencies in internal control considered to be material weaknesses. Uh, the results are also disclosed with no instances of non-compliance or other matters that are required to be reported. Uh, and there are um, occasions when if the school district receives, um, uh, there's a threshold that is reached if the school district receives um, federal uh, grants. Uh, I don't know what that total is, but um, we could be audited by the federal government if uh, if we exceed a certain amount. And I don't think we've hit that in a long time. But um, we also discussed the, um, the, um, this year's budget. And um, there was nothing too extraordinary in the monthly budget report, except for line item 960. And that showed, uh, a negative of $53,343. And that was basically for the repairs um, that we had to, to, to do as a result of the lightning strike. And I'm certain that that is not the total, but hopefully we will recoup some of that expenditure by, um, from the insurance. And that's about the end of my report. Any questions? Thank you, John. Okay, we'll move on to uh, superintendent's report. All right, well, thank you again. Uh, I, I really wanna take a, a moment to um, congratulate our students who uh, performed at our World Affairs Forum. And I say performed because they took on some really challenging topics and came out so exceptionally well in their presentation, in their debate structure. So the World Affairs Forum was held last Saturday um, and Wendy Lewis had presented and she talked about grabbing the golden ring. And the entire idea is that maybe not always knowing that you have everything you need to be successful, but how do you grab that opportunity when it affords itself to you. And she talked about her time as the wife of um, uh, her husband who is in the United Nations and talking about her role in diplomacy and things that she has done. Um, just, it was amazing and inspiring. But sadly, she was overshadowed by our students. Our students, when they were challenged about how they felt and taking on tough world um, political topics. And one of the audience members went so far as to say to the panel that they did not believe that any um, wife of a leader should then themselves be a leader. And I will tell you, <laughs> our students <laughs> had an answer. And I will tell you, what you saw was our students 
respectfully debating, providing a counter argument, and doing so in a way that was knowledgeable, well-researched. I could not have been prouder of our students and their performance. And to know the hours that Chris Dennis has put into this and what he does to make certain that our students have an opportunity to shine as scholars was remarkable. We just walked away inspired. And I spend a lot of time during these updates and I spend a lot of time on Chippewa. I spend a lot of time showcasing because we know it's the flagship school and this is, look at here's all the culmination of Region 12. But I can't not talk about some of our elementary schools right now. And congratulating our kindergartners who are working so hard to make it certain that they know their sight words. And our first graders who right now were busy catching leprechauns for St. Patrick's Day and being inventive and innovative in how they were gonna capture the leprechauns. I'm so proud of our second graders who are working on their fast facts to make certain that they beat their own time next time. And our third graders who are making certain they are increasing their volumes of reading as they enter into their chapter books and display proudly how many they've gotten through. Our fourth and fifth graders who are working on multiplication and the high fives that are happening when they've mastered their 12s tables. And I share these things with you because our students don't just show up as pennies from heaven in Chipotle. That there's a firm foundation that is happening in our elementary schools. And that our elementary staff is continuing to provide learning challenges like readathons, Pi Days, spelling bees, geography bees, play, plays, computer science, maker spaces, all of these things to make certain they have the executive functioning necessary to be successful at Chipotle. And it also means that we can't lose sight of the investment of our elementary schools. And whether or not we're looking at the facilities that our students are learning in, or the type of programs that are being offered at our elementary schools. Our elementary schools have shown we can do multi-age and do it extremely well. And so right now we're exploring some new models, some new ideas. And we've gone out and we've looked at a dual language program as an opportunity to enrich the elementary experience and what that would look like to take a look at some arts programs and what can we infuse. And we're also looking at international baccalaureate programs and micro society. How do we make our students feel like they are part of a culture in our schools? And so I share all these things because as we start to move through our long range planning and we've been having these conversations, I don't want this board to lose sight because we celebrate so loudly what's happened when they've done throughout. So it's that grand gesture of graduation, but there's so many things that are happening along the way. And so I just wanted to take a moment to just celebrate elementary schools right now. So um, we have some personnel uh, changes that have been happening. And so I wanna celebrate. We have some appointments. Uh, we'd like to welcome Paige Johnson to the JV softball coach team. Um, and so she will be joining our softball players and we're very excited of what she's going to do. They took it to states last year and even that was with a whole lot of recruiting going on in the hallway. So I can't wait to see what they do this year. We also have Jeremy Pendergast. Mm -hmm. uh, he will be joining us as the boys tennis coach. And from what I'm told, he is one to watch. He's a phenomenal player. And I think he's going to do really great things with that program. So we're very excited to welcome them. We have a leave of absence. Uh, Brita Mercier, uh, a paraprofessional at Washington Primary School. And actually, she did return early. She is back today. And uh, we have some field trips that I want to notify the board about. I'm so excited to have this really normal thing to do right now is to notify you of field trips. Um, but our, our, um, our Chipog AgriScience is going to the Arbor Trade Show at the uh, Big E Fairgrounds in West Springfield. That will be happening on Thursday, 
and we have the Great East Music Festival that will be at Six Flags in Agawam. And this has been about two years in the making. We really, we've wanted to get them there. This is a fantastic music festival. We've lost a lot of momentum in our music program because of COVID. So I think these opportunities for our students to get back in, to feel refreshed and innovative, by other people in their performances. We're very excited to return this. So that concludes my update, unless there are any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to committee reports now. We'll start with uh, Justin, cur Curriculum and Educational Programming. Uh, nothing new to report. Our meeting tonight was canceled and our next meeting is May 2nd. Okay, very good. We'll look forward to the next report. Uh, Joe, uh, at advance. I attended the uh, Zoom meeting on March 3rd for the Board of Directors. And during that meeting, we approved uh, the applications for McKinney-Vento grant, the healthy food certificates for both uh, healthy food option and the food and beverage exemptions. <clears throat> Board was also updated with uh, the current uh, year budget. Um, which was showing a surplus in most areas. Uh, also, um, they are still undergoing an internal research on recruitment and retention as they are still having shortages in some areas. Uh, also, they are working on two new uh, Head Start locations for Torrington and Winchester as they lost them due to the COVID uh, expansion in the schools. And that's all I have for this report. Joe, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to finance and operations. Alex. Yes, uh, I'm a little bit, I apologize for repeating some of the things John said. Uh, we, what we've been focusing on are several items. One was the audit. And one of the things that John sort of referred to but didn't sort of specify is there are three ways of auditing numbers. There's the federal way, the state way, and the way we do it. <laughs> and uh, so it, it gets a little confusing when you say, well, what's the number? And they say, well, wh which, which plan are you looking at? But uh, the good news is, and I think I got this right, um, if we use the, our way of doing the budgeting, we came in under budget uh, last, uh, in uh, 2021. Um, now I'm not sure cause I kept pressing her for what's the exact number. And the only number I got out her was $434,000. Um, whether that was the federal, the state or our way, I don't know, but all three ways we came in under budget. Um, and as John mentioned, our pension fund is in great shape. Um, I doubt whether anybody else in the state has their uh, pension fund as well funded as we do, and maybe the country. Uh, the other thing we talked about was the budget, but I'm not gonna go into that right now because we'll deal with that next week. Um, and the final thing that we talked about were uh, some of the, uh, the work that needs to be done in our different buildings. Uh, as you're probably aware, the Burnham's roof is gonna be replaced this summer. Uh, we got a bid from uh, Barrett Roofing. Um, there are going to be a couple of change orders to it. Uh, Don wants to put on uh, uh, heat tape uh, so that the snow will melt and not fall off in sheets on the kids as they walk by or adults too. Um, but th that's well underway. Uh, currently, there is uh, the Chapog windows are out to bid. Uh, there'll be a walkthrough on May 7th. Uh, to, with uh, all the uh, proposed contractors. So uh, we're looking forward to getting the windows done. Uh, just as a little brag on Don here, uh, Booth is going to be repainted. And uh, he budgeted uh, 25000 for that. And the bid that came in was $24,850. So he missed it by $150. So, uh, but it came in under $150. Uh, the last thing, which is a little scary, uh, is the HVAC. Um, the 
state is is considering different plans now, and they've sort of thrown a, a curve at us. It's not only a, the temperature that they're concerned about, but it's the humidity. And the problem with dealing with humidity is the way you get rid of it is you get the air really cool, and then you heat it back up. So you may be dropping your, your temperature down to, say, in the 50s, and then bringing it back up to the 70s. So it could be awfully expensive to run. Uh, but this is still up in the air. But the HVAC is something we're going to have to keep our eyes on for the uh, elementary schools uh, uh, because it's something it's it's going to come to us at some point in some form. Um, and the last thing we discussed was uh, this uh, Region 12 uh, public school enrollment projections. Uh, which I think you need to take with a grain of salt. It, you know, predicting the future is never easy, uh, if possible at all, but we discussed that also. And that is it. I would be glad to answer any questions anybody might have. Okay. Questions? Thank you, Alex. Labor negotiations, I have nothing to report. Our next negotiation will be in the fall with the union representing our teachers. Uh, strategic long-range planning, Julie. Um, okay, we haven't had a meeting since our last report. However, we have continued to gather information both from students, faculty, and the community and our responses to our written survey far exceeded what our expectations were. So we're thrilled to get so many responses and we'll be getting a full report out on that uh, consolidated information at our next meeting next week. Good. Yep, that's it. Thank Keep you. us posted, we're looking forward to seeing that. Okay, I think that's it for committee reports and we're now moving on to F, new business and updates. The one item under this site is the cafeteria presentation of improvements with Ed Advance. Becky Tyrell. Yeah. And I assume is the same. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name's Becky Tyrell. I'm the chairperson. Oh, listen to me. I'm the Board of Education um, chairperson. I was the Board of Education chairperson in Plainville, um, just now a board member. And I just do that by accident. I apologize. <laughs> I'm sitting over here watching you guys and listening and going, oh, this is really kind of different. And so I, I'm actually a bit of a nerd for Board of Education, watch and see what other people do. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. But um, I am um, on Ed Advance. I'm the um, I'm the food service director for the programs that we run there, and we have been working with your district for a couple of years. And I appreciate you having me come out this evening to talk a little bit about the program. Um, you can go to the next slide. So can I do it then? Yeah. All right. All right. So um, just want to mention that we've had quite an increase in participation. Now, that's happened over the past couple of years. Uh, obviously, since COVID, um, you know, changed our worlds, uh, it certainly changed the world in uh, food service. And um, the past two years we've had the participation increase due to the fact that all students are eating their first meals breakfast and lunch for free um, and that will change next year um, and we've also had quite a bit of a increase in the participation even from last year to this year so appreciate that um, we've had quite a bit of success at the elementary level, which I knew is, um, was a new program for the district. 
um, parents seem to like the ordering system that we're using. And last uh, winter, we did a survey because it's cold food that we're, we're bringing there um, and the variety isn't as great as we would like it to be. We did do a survey with parents. We got some ideas um, and made a few changes on the menu to try and um, offer a little more variety with that program that seemed to be fairly well received. Um, Excuse me, Becky, can I interrupt you to ask a question? Yep. How, how does that food ordering program work? How does it work? Yeah, I, I, is, is, I assume it's on the, is it on the, the district's website or? Yes. Yep, there's a, there's a, is it Power, what's it Power called? School? No, it's not Power, NutriSlice, yeah. NutriSlice, I, I forgot, has a ordering function and it just works for the elementary schools. So a parent can go on and order, I believe, up to a month in advance. We, we made it that way. Oh, okay, um, wonderful. Thank you. And choose what they want. And, you know, there's a couple of different options, and they can choose that for their child. Um, that seems to be working pretty well. Um, so, and we've been working in general to improve some variety and uh, presentation in the district just in general. So now I can, I can move this myself. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. It's on some computer. Do I have to go? <laughs> I'll go over there and hit it if you want me to. It's gonna be it's gonna be quick once I get going. So all right. There we go. Okay. So this shows you some numbers, uh, participation numbers from December, January, and February of last school year versus Jan December, January, and February of this school year. Um, we are showing breakfast participation, and that was, um, that obviously is just at Chapog. Um, and you can see that in December, we went um, from 791 to 813, a little a little bump, not too much. Um, but the lunch program in December uh, from year to year went from 3,768 to 5,740. Um, that's a big jump. In the month of January, our breakfast did bump up quite a bit more from 581 to 709. And lunch from 3,963 to 5,515. And breakfast again in February bumped up considerably, uh, 419 to 824, and lunch 2515 to 5492. So, um, you know, we're proud of the fact that we've had that increase. We've been working hard to try and provide some better, you know, uh, better options, more variety, and uh, making sure that we're keeping everybody happy, we hope. So just to show you a couple of what our, you know, a couple of ideas of what our meals look like, this happens to be um, a different um, item, Fries Supreme. It was something different that we had never served before. The kids seem to like it pretty well, and, and we just like to try and keep things looking a little exciting and different. Um, this was a Salisbury steak meal. We are trying really hard to provide a lot of fruits and vegetables that the kids will like. These are our side salads. This is what's known as a rainbow tray. We, um, you know, we know that in order to make a compliant meal, children need to choose fruits and vegetables. So we try and give them a lot of things to choose from so they'll find something they like. And we also have uh, daily alternate meals. So um, salads, sandwiches, and things like that if someone does not particularly care for the meal that we put out for that day. So for next, moving forward, um, next year, the first thing that's going to happen, at least at this moment, you never know, things could change. But at this moment, um, the waivers that are allowing all children to have free meals will end um, as of June 30th. So we will be going back to trying to work through how you know, charging, charging families, charging children, 
again. Um, and we will really need the district to help us spread that word because we're a little concerned that you know people have not been dealing with that aspect of, of um, school meals for two years and it's hard to kind of get back into the groove. Um, and we'll also be asking folks to complete um, applications again as they had in the past. Uh, there is also a new policy requirement uh, for um, negative lunch balances and and what I'm going to do is when I find a good sample of that policy, I can forward it on to Megan um, or Nicole and, and they can show it to you and, and see if you want to look at something like that. <clears throat> it's very specific in the fact that, um, I think it's called like the anti-shaming bill um, and it does not allow you to provide any different kind of meal for students who um, have a negative balance. Um, and it's very prescriptive of how you want to tell the parents to um, to parents to you know that the that their child is negative and who you have to you know the information that you have to provide to them. Um, one exciting thing is that we are starting to have smoothies in the month of May. We did um, apply for a grant through the New England Dairy Council and were awarded a smoothie machine, um, and so we've been working on that. We've um, planning on doing some trial and some, you know, making sure the kids like the kind of smoothies that we're going to provide for them. So that's going to start in May. Uh, we also are looking to increase local produce usage through the collaboration with the Northwest uh, Connecticut Food Hub. Um, the Food Hub is located in, in Torrington, but it has, um, it's a group of farmers and agriculture folks who are working with ag agriculture in the region. And so we've started working with them in some of our other districts. And so I'm hoping to get them to be able to participate with them here and do some of the local produce here as well. Um, we are gonna be working with the agri-science department to increase student engagement with local produce um, in the school. Um, and as a matter of fact, I wanna say tomorrow morning or Wednesday morning, I'm meeting with um, Rachel Murray. Um, from the ag department and she is the one that reached out to me and is a, um, kind of wanted to do something with students and pr local produce. So I, I could stop there if you have any questions about the program but I was just going to talk for a little bit about healthy food certification. So if you don't have any questions I'll carry on. I have a question about the program. You mentioned that um, starting in September, let's say, so the um, government assisted uh, uh, meals uh, end in June. So um, I'm assuming that in September, students are gonna go back to paying um, and um, is there anticipated a um, significant price increase? Who's going to determine the pricing for this stuff? So the price will remain the same, whatever the board approved previously. Um, anytime a price change occurs, uh, the board always has to approve it. And so whatever, I, I can't even remember where we were two years ago. Um, so the price would remain the same. Um, and it is, a, it is a bit of a challenge because obviously you all know going to the grocery store what the, you know, what the cost of food is. And it's the same thing for us in purchasing food um, from you know, our purveyors. Is there's definitely um, an increase in price, so it's a little tough. But um, you know, we, I, I think it's already enough of a, of a change that it'd be, we'd really like to keep the price the same um, and hopefully everything will work its way out and we won't have to make any adjustments. Any other questions? Yeah, um, do you offer just one meal for lunch and then they can opt out and go to the sandwich or salads or do you have multiple choices at lunch? So sometimes they have multiple hot meals, um, but oftentimes they have one hot meal and then we also have the multiple, you know. They can opt out and go to the thing get a salad or a sandwich right. or something right so if you, you had like salisbury steak i saw there 
um, if that that would be your hot meal for the day. Yes. I got you. Thank you. Um, and here too. She was so loud. Okay. Um, oh my god. This is. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. So I unmute myself here. Okay. And then turn that down. I'll get there. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So I guess there was. I had noticed at one point. Um, we had an, an, a huge amount of produce at the Chapag cafeteria. And I guess the question that I have for you is, is how, and you can't return that. So once you receive it, either goes bad or you try, you try your best to make sure that it's offered. But how, how do you, how do you navigate that so that you don't waste food, but because I, it's, I imagine, and I'm not an expert at this, but it's tricky to not return. So I know that's been a concern. One of, one of the things that we have done, we um, have several schools that we sponsor mm -hmm. um, in the region. And so when someone has additional produce and they know they're not going to be able to use it or milk for that matter, anything like that, that it, that's, you know, um, so date dependent. Um, we call the schools, call each other and see if anybody needs it. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's the last thing we want to do is to waste any food. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, sometimes things like a snow day, uh, you know, can really throw things off because especially if it happens on a, a couple of days before you're going off for a vacation or something like that. Yeah. Um, that can be an issue. And I, I assume obviously the the number the the huge jump in numbers is because it was free lunch. So we know that that's a, a, a big reason um, for the increase. I guess my concern is is that you can't make everybody happy. It's just how I mean I certainly can't even in my own home. So that's easy. Um, but I guess wondering how we could find ways to make it so that the parents feel a little bit more not involved in the process, but because I, I just wonder if there's a way, like, I like the pictures that you're showing, but I wonder if there's a way to sort of create a virtual walkthrough so parents can kind of just see what the options are. Because what kids come home and say and what actually is there, or can don't, don't always mesh, right? They don't align. So I think having an opportunity to maybe have some sort of visual video of what is, in fact, at Chapag or at the elementary schools allows parents to kind of get a, a real read on what's being served and how it looks and maybe some background. Cause I think that that would be really helpful. That's, Just a, that's my a great cents. idea. And I actually, one of the, one of my department goals this year is to come up with some better marketing. <clears throat> yeah. You know, uh, you know, we're not a food service management company. If <laughs> right. food service management companies have a lot of slick information that's not us, you know, we're a RESC. We're, um, we serve school districts in whatever way or capacity they need us. Yeah. And um, sometimes something like marketing is, is, a, is like, it's the last thing we do and it's unfortunate because it's really important. Yeah. Um, but that's actually one of my goals this year is to try and develop a kind of a, a, a purposeful program of, of how do we get our word out there yeah. and make sure people see what we're doing. Um, and that's one of the things with the local produce that we want to make sure as well. Well, um, I think that that's another really important factor too, is to highlight that. And if you had a virtual walkthrough with a student kind of using their iPhone, going through and saying, this are the options, but also to being mindful about environmentally friendly packaging. I know that that was a huge issue during COVID. And I know that there are a lot of parents and people just really feeling that that's wasteful too. And I think that that would be something that would be I hope people. I hope that you are thinking about, but also showing that there's progress in being mindful about that too would be a huge help. Yeah, as you can as you can imagine, 
you know, packaging is, um, a, a, it's, it's hard to get around it completely. Yeah. Um, especially in, in a district where there's no, there's no dishwasher there was, the kitchen was not made with a dishwasher. So, um, it's kind of hard to, mm -hmm. to use the trays that some of the districts where the, where there's a dishwasher are using. Um, but you know, in, during COVID, obviously packaging became even more difficult, um, and pricey. Uh, so we are always trying to find ways you know, to be resourceful. Um, it's a big hot button issue, especially, I mean, I'm sure everywhere, but I know in our community in particular, there are a lot of people who are feeling that that's something that needs to be addressed. So yeah, just, yeah. I, I appreciate that Thank feedback you. as well. Thank you. Okay. Alex, do we have a parent stay here at school? Megan? A parent's day? What do yeah, you where parents come in and actually sit in on classes and things of that nature. No, we do not. No. What I was thinking of was have a day where parents could actually come and have lunch um, and see what the thing is. I mean, it's one thing to send them pictures. Another thing to have them come in and sit down and, you know, have a Salisbury steak lunch and see what see what their kids are actually getting. Um, I don't know. Um, it's, it's a great thought um with baby steps to like covid opening up our doors but yeah i, I love the idea <laughs> when we can fit more people in the cafeteria um yeah but I, th I think i think what i'm hearing and what i'm i'm hearing across the board is this desire to make certain that people know what's being put in front of our students and to have that experience and be it a visual experience, the actual taste experience, but to get perspective. And I think what you're offering are some ideas in which we can start driving that perspective. We have occasionally done things like open houses, you know, again, pre-COVID and eventually um, get back to things like that where we can, you know, be there and, and present some of what we have um, offering, and that seems to be pretty successful as well. So you'll let us know when you have the parents' tasting menu, the the sixteen course parents tasting. Yeah. Menu. <laughs> then come in and try everything their kids might experience. Sixteen course. In a couple weeks. <laughs> anyway, back to you. All right. So on your agenda, you do have um, the vote, your annual vote um, on the healthy food certification um, that, you know, is required by the state uh, for any school district that's participating in the national school lunch. You um, every year will decide whether or not you want to follow the what's known as the um, the Connecticut nutrition standards um, and become healthy food certified. Um, and districts that choose that option um, receive 10 cents per lunch uh, based on the total number of reimbursable lunches served in the prior school year. So there is a definitely a little financial perk there. Let's see, okay. So what you may not know though is um, by virtue of being a district that participates in the National School Lunch Program, you are already part of the USDA's Smart Snacks nutrition standards. Um, so that's that comes with the National School Lunch Program, and <clears throat> the um, healthy food certification is just a different step. Um, and basically, what happens, what the, what those nutrition standards do, is they pretty much are uh, governing what happens with any what we call competitive foods. That are, that are sold in our schools. So when they say competitive foods, they mean any food sold that is not part of a school meal, okay? Um, so let's take a look. I think I gotta go one more. Yep. So the USDA Smart Snacks um, rule says that um, every food that is served and sold during the school day in a school um, has to be compliant with Smart Snacks. And the state of Connecticut and the Connecticut nutrition standards is a little different 
because basically it says that that the competitive foods have to be compliant any time on the school premises. So this means, you know, even after school, um, if kids, you know, are staying after because there's a game or, or they're doing anything else, um, they they have to follow. We have to make sure that there's nothing being sold in the schools that is not compliant with the Connecticut school with the Connecticut nutrition standards. Um, the one thing that is kind of the savings grace for that situation, obviously, is exemption. So you'll notice that you have more than one vote. If you vote to be healthy food certified, you then can vote on exemptions. Um, so the state of Connecticut has made it so that there you're allowed to serve whatever you would like, and and you know in defiance, I guess I'll say, of, of the uh, smart snacks. Um, you know, requirement um, in three, when there's three conditions that are met. One is that um, the sale is in connection with an event that occurs after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Um, the second is that the sale happens at the location of the event. And this is kind of like if there's a football game, um, you know, or some kind of a game and they want to, and you want to serve, you know, the, the backers want to serve food at the game that's fine, but they're not supposed to serve it in another area. I don't know why that's their rule, but that's their rule. Um, and also, they don't want the food sold from a vending machine or a school store. So that's really um, the, three, the three things that you can vote to, to um, follow the exemption so that you can actually have that kind of you know, option to provide food um, other than the compliant food when it's an event. Um, and after school or on the weekend. Okay. Um, Did I ask that's, a question for you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing in this action item that we're going to have that we're going to have to certify in one that these that we're only serving food that meets the Connecticut nutrition standards. Um, how do we know that we're only serving food that meets the Connecticut? Is that something you do? Yeah. So that what that means is that anytime you sell anything in the in the school, if you if you had a school store, we would make sure that what's in that school store is is compliant. Um, you know, those are those are the kinds of things that that we work out with um, anybody that we work with that that is healthy food certified. Um, it's you know, there's a huge list of foods that are allowed and items that are allowed and then some things that are not allowed. All right. Well, I, I presume the administration of the district makes sure that you do that because asking us to certify that we're serving only the right food is be better luck asking my dog in terms of getting an answer that's useful. Uh, and I don't mean to denigrate the members of the board. It's just that we don't, we're not in the building. We're not examining the food, and we don't know what the standards are. Right. I, I, if one day the Connecticut will not pass laws that require things like this to be done by people that have no idea. Uh -huh. uh, but the legislature thinks it has accomplished something here, and it really is just wasting everyone's time. So <laughs> fortunately, you're here to, to help to save us from ourselves. So I appreciate that. Well, and, and in most districts, the, you know, the building administration is also, you know, they have a few other things to do besides checking to see what's in the labels and, you know, that kind of thing. So usually it's, it is a food service. Um, you know, it's, it's a food service job to make sure that everything, you know, that's in the building is compliant. Well, we're very much, very appreciative of your making sure that everything is compliant. And, and if I understand this correctly, the second resolution is that if you're doing it with to meeting these three tests of being in connection with an event after school or on a weekend, located, a location of the sale is at the event and the food is not sold from a vending machine or school store, this means that basically during the school day, we should only serve them good compliant food, but after hours, all bets are off? Well, it has to be an event. So, right. and they get very specific, right? It's not, if it's a practice, that's not an event. They define what an event is, right? If it's a game, that's an event. If it's a, you know, play rehearsal, that's not an event. The play is an event, you uh, know, so. All right, so who, who serves this food? It would be, it could be, it's usually fundraisers. So it's usually somebody like the backers or, you know, the um, the folks that are that are running, you know, or they're having the play or trying to make some money for their program. So they're doing it. Yeah, but see, uh, the, the thing about that is, and I hate to say this, but we've had a law, having, having actually been the, uh, 
the music director for one of the plays we did a number of years ago, I can tell you that what happens at play rehearsals is parents come in and feed those kids at, at every rehearsal because the kids are here sometimes as late as midnight. Right. And I, we can't do that anymore. So I hope someone has taken the position. So, right, right. Oh, the this difference. is only for sales. You have to sell this. It doesn't matter what you feed. So actually, as long as you're not selling it to them, you can feed them anything. This, the, at least not during the you know you no, don't no, want to no. do I, that I, during the school day but after at the end after, of the school yeah. day you could do anything like after that. the school day you okay so we don't have a problem with that I just right. wanted to make sure before we ended up getting ourselves and our parents in trouble and people keep the parties because I know that's always an interesting one that gets a sticky widget so you want to share like how, how that works and what you did like so are you talking about during the school day okay so the problem. If someone says, I want to, you know, I want to bring in pizza for, um, you know, my class is that it's a, it's it, even though they aren't selling it, that's considered a competition with the national school lunch program. OK, so you're not supposed to provide food, even if it's not for sale during the time slots in which food is being sold. And it's a half an hour before or a half an hour after your times of either breakfast or lunch. Um, so that's where the problem comes in. And that's even food that you're giving away. Obviously, you're not selling it. Um, but what most people do get concerned about with healthy food certification is that they're worried about how it impacts their fundraisers um, and especially, you know, after hour fundraisers. So the exemption allows <coughs> the fundraisers to continue. Um, All right, but, but let me ask you something. If, if you had a situation where some group or some club or something wanted to hold a pizza, wanted to have a, a pizza thing, and they all had to chip in to get it. That violates the rule, doesn't it? Because now you're selling it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it depends on how how is that orchestrated. It's, it's well, I I guess the question is if if it, I could see different situations here, and we're, and I'm trying to understand which ones are are okay and which ones are not. You could have a situation in which parents chip in and buy pizzas and bring them into the school and give them to the kids. Yep. Does the parents having paid for them actually amount to a sale? No, I don't think that would be a sale. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry to so, grill you with legal questions. Yeah, I, I know, and 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 you know, it's I, funny. <laughs> it's it's funny because uh, you know every time we talk about this, people always have different scenarios, and 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 sometimes I answer it and I'm like, was I right about that? And then you know, um, so I doubt myself, but. In a situation like that, as long as it wasn't interfering with the meal time, lunch, right. meal time, or breakfast, you know, pizza for breakfast, I like that. Um, you know, as long as it wasn't interfering with the meal time, that would be fine. So, All right. So, so the next the next question is when the students chip in money to have pizzas brought in, is that a sale? Because that looks an awful lot like a sale. Yeah, that sounds more like a sale. Well, however, I don't envy the administration of the school figuring <laughs> these things out, uh, but we better. You know, we get we get a lot of questions and uh, people call and every once in a while, this is recorded, isn't it? Every once in a while, I, I say, like, I am not going to see that, you know, it end of the school year. You know, things happen. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, we've got kids. This is school. You know, we want to be as reasonable as we can. Um, but at the same time, we want to be um, we want to be true to the program because, you know, these programs are definitely funded by the federal and state government. And we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. Lisa. I don't have a question. I just have a comment that I think this is really sad <laughs> and I feel bad for the kids. I mean, again, this is my opinion, but pizza parties, birthdays you know, field days. And I, I just think that that's all part of childhood and growing up. And I just think, and this is not against you, please forgive me, but I just think, I think about the kids and I just, I feel really sad that this is happening. So that's just my comment. Yeah. I think Lisa makes a really good point because, you know, there's a difference. It'd be one thing if we were feeding you know, if we were making it so that people could eat the same horrid, overly gross thing every day, uh, as opposed to some, you know, the, the, eating pizza three meals a day, probably not the greatest idea. But these parties, uh, I, I think she's got a point. 
Nicole. I, I, I'm sorry, Nicole, can we get you a mic here because we can't hear you. Hi, Becky. With respect to the pizza parties, can you clarify, is that something that's not allowed under the National School Lunch Program, right. or is that something that's not allowed under the Healthy Food Certification? Right. So the situation with the pizza party is actually not part of Healthy Food Certification, as Nicole says. It's part of the National School Lunch Program itself and the non-competitive non food part. And that, and that goes under Smart Snacks without having to go on to being healthy food certified, it's it's just um, it's considered a competition. Now you can have a pizza party; it just can't be within a half an hour before or half an hour after the lunch period. That's that's the situation, and you know um, something like like uh, you know a fa uh, like a birthday party where you know, where somebody brings in cookies, that's perfectly fine. Some some school districts. Um, do things where they where they allow parents to um, purchase you know a food item from the cafeteria actually, and all the kids in the class get whatever an ice cream or whatever they whatever they want, and and then it's it's quote unquote a compliant food, everybody gets it, um, and it kind of removes that issue. But most don't do that. Most most families are still bringing in things for their kids for birthdays. Um, and, you know, especially at the elementary level, I think. Okay. Did that questions? clear that up, Nicole? All so right. um, that, was, that was all I, you know, that was the end of my, my presentation. And I, I thank you for having me out. Hopefully I got you thinking about something other than your budget for a little bit. Um, I know how, how crazy that can be. So thank you. You, you did, Becky. That was tremendous. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. So now we're on to the action items on tonight's agenda. 1A, or I say 1, rather. Uh, uh, do we have a motion to accept the fiscal year 2021 Region 12 annual audit report as recommended by the Finance and Operations Committee? Mo motion is there second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. As you all saw, it was a pretty clean uh, audit report and uh, pretty comprehensive. So, okay, good. So, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Chairman votes aye. It's unanimous. Okay, no, item number two is, and I'm going to read this, so it's we we'll attest afterwards. To consider, if appropriate, pursuant to Connecticut General Statute Section 10-215F, the Board of Education, or governing authority, certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in the schools under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut Nutrition Standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with the Connecticut Nutrition Standards during the period of July 1, 2022 through June 30, 2023. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, culinary programs, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or non-school organizations and groups. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt that resolution? Moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion. Nicole, can you remind me again? I, this may be the first time we've ever approved this because for years we never, maybe we did it last year, but we never, ever, ever adopted this for reasons that I think you told me once were not any longer of a concern. Correct. Region 12 has never adopted the healthy food certification, but I think it was based in, in some part on the confusion of 
um, not being able to have those exempted activities that Becky spoke to, which is your next motion, and also that if you don't adopt this, then you don't have to follow the rules that are already part of being a sponsor of the National School Lunch Program. So as I asked Becky to clarify, the pizza party type things, that's not what you're voting on tonight. Those, as a sponsor of the National School Lunch Program, we have to follow those rules. This is in addition to that, about sales outside of the lunch period, about things that are sold in the schools. Right, so for all those years we didn't do it, we now feel that we can. And, and you see no reason, no economic or regulatory reason that you're aware of that would cause us to be in trouble if we adopted this? No, I, I've generally most of the districts that I've worked with or I'm familiar with do adopt this. Okay, questions or other comments? Yes, Alex. What would be the downside of not adopting it? I mean, well, I don't you can see say what goodbye the to. Uh, <laughs> What's the upside sir. of adopting it? Let me put it that way. You get additional. Oh, additional what, is money. this a ten cents a meal? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Other comments? All right. If there's nothing further, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Chairman votes aye. That would be 11 1 0. Okay. Third item to consider, and if appropriate, the Board of Education or Governing Authority will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut Nutrition Standards and beverages not listed in Section 10-221Q of the Connecticut General Statutes provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on a weekend. Two, the sale is at a location of the event. And three, the food and beverage items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. An event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meeting, or extracurricular activity. For example, soccer games, school plays, the inter and interscholastic debates are, are events, but soccer practices, play rehearsals, and debate team meetings are not. The regular school day is the period from midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. Location means where the event is being held and must be the same place as the food and beverage sales. Everyone understand that? You got that committed? Good. Okay, is there a motion to adopt that resolution? I'll make the motion. Okay, moved. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Please say nay. All those abstaining. I hear no abstention, so I hear 10 ayes, 2 nays. And I am presuming, unless someone says something, that no one didn't vote at all. Okay? All right, so that's adopted 10, 2, 0. Okay, now item number 4. To consider, and if appropriate, approve the last day of school for students on Thursday, June 16, and Friday, June 17, for teachers, bringing the school year to 180 days for students and 186 days for teachers and support staff. Is there a motion to approve this? Moved. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. Discussion. One thing I'll remind everyone is, is by setting the last day of uh, school, this holds for our, our people graduating. So uh, for whatever reason, this day had to be extended because we get a snow day that cancels school or some other event that cancels school. Graduation will still be on the graduation date, or is that just the establishment of graduation that does that? Mm -hmm. The last day of school does nothing you because you might have to extend it if something happens. You are completely correct on that. Um, so graduation right now has already been approved by the board for June 11th. So we knew that was the 
Saturday before, they were supposed to be the two half days at the end of the school year, and then Mother Nature decided to laugh at us. Um, we know that right now, uh, the state of Connecticut uh, allows 180 school days. And Region 12, we do 183. And it is always a, a pride and fact that for us, education, we commit more than what is expected. I can tell you, I think we all know, this is another taxing year. This has been one in which we have teachers who are substituting for missing teachers. We are really doing things in order to support from within, which also means this is another year we're burning out our staff. And so I, I think that having our students conclude at the 180th day, it also allows our parents to start planning for their summer vacations. If they get to plan for camps, what's happening with their childcare and setting up um, what they need to do, I think doing the 180 days feels that we have satisfied the requirements of the school year. I would like the teachers to come in the additional day. We also know they need time to clean up. They, are, they need times in which we can make certain that the schools are then closed down. Um, but it is for giving two days in which we would still be paying our staff for those two days because they are contracted for 188 days but reducing it to 186 as a way to recognize the above and beyond efforts that have happened, that continue to happen through the pandemic. So I am asking the board to consider this motion. Okay, so the bottom line of this is, um, because graduation has been established and you've now established the end of the school year after graduation, the seniors will be invited to come back after the 11th Uh, but I guess they will suffer no penalty if they do. <laughs> okay. Uh, any discussion of this event, this motion? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying. I thought we made a motion. We did. We made a motion and seconded it. It happened at this end of the table, so it might have. Okay. Uh, moved and seconded. No further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. And all those abstaining, please so indicate. And anyone who did not vote, tell me. Otherwise, I see that as 11 to 1 to nothing. Okay. Um, do I have a motion uh, to go into this executive session to discuss a, person a matter of personnel? Is there a second? Okay. Uh, before we vote on it, um, we will go into executive session to discuss a matter of personnel, and we will come out of executive session and take any votes that we have to take as a result of that. Uh, good enough. So, all those in favor of going to executive session needs two thirds vote. Please, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. All those abstaining. It's unanimous. We are going into executive session, and I think we are. Going to the conference, uh, the conference room back over here. We are back in order at uh, 9:34 and a half minutes. All right. Um, I am going to take. Uh, we have two items that are coming out of the executive session uh, that we are going to, two motions we're going to put on the floor, and I'm going to take the chairman's prerogative of making both of these motions. Uh, though the hardest thing I have had to do as your chairman, standing before you now, I hereby move that with a heavy heart, unfathomable regret, yet unrestrained, uncanceled, and unending gratitude for service above and beyond the call of duty, much less our outsized expectations. I move that we hereby, on behalf of a grateful student body, faculty, staff, and community, reluctantly accept the resignation of our partner in this most important endeavor, Megan Bennett, as superintendent of schools for Regional School District 12, effective July 1, 2022. And we wish her, her husband, Ken, and their children, Jordan and Lauren, health, happiness and success in the exciting future that awaits them. Is there a, I move that, is there a second? 
All right, now I will open the floor to any comments or things people care to make. Uh, I had a couple of little remarks. I just wanted to put this in context and remind you of a few things that you may have forgotten. We were sitting in a room on April 25th, 2018, and at that time we were at the crossroads of the future of our, our, our district as a, as, as a school. We were facing declining enrollment. That meant tiny middle high school. That's going to threaten the high quality of education that has made this a blue ribbon school and a hallmark school. Uh, we were embarking on the boldest thing we've done in 50 years. We were the first, biggest project, biggest construction project, biggest school project of, of, of learning. Um, and, and this was the idea we had that was going to save our d diminishing school. And we were, we were going to design what we, we called not the 20th VOAG school in Connecticut, but the first 21st century Agri Science Academy. And we were facing the most consequential decision you have as a board. This is the only person we hire as the superintendent of schools, and we were facing the hiring of the superintendent of schools. And believe me, we needed a miracle. We needed the five-tool baseball player of school leaders. We needed someone who could not only do everything we required and do it well, but do it Hall of Fame well. And there were, there we were, and we were presented with a stunningly promising and as I've said before, impossibly young woman who, while she had an impressive resume, was well-spoken and was the only interview candidate, I might remind you, who when offered a problem to solve, was the only one to pick our most vexing problem. What happens on the cliff drop-off in educational achievement from grade five to grade six? All right, she was the only one that addressed that. But you know what? As we knew at the time, she'd never actually held the position of superintendent of schools. So then... We saw that promise and talent, and we decided to take the plunge and hire her. And since then, this amazing educator has delivered on every single vestige of her promise, tackling declining enrollment, recognizing that with a brilliant staff and building leader, anything is possible. She leveraged that talent to put a multi-age program at Burnham School, taking that from the fading dream of Captain William Burnham to an educational powerhouse. She elevated Washington Primary from a school of high achievement and great promise to our most popular elementary school. She presided over this year's crowning of Booth Free School as the best public elementary school in the state of Connecticut. Recognizing ag science and the reinvention of our science lab was the cornerstone of our path back to reclaiming excellence. She went to school on those arcane state agency grant funding requirements that not only delivered the promised funding just in the nick of time, but did so under a newly birthed agency whose rules were unprecedented, and in the process earned the respect of that agency with transparency and competence, the hallmarks of her superintendency. She made a reality, the AgriScience Academy at Chapaug Valley School, which she did let me name it, perhaps the best agri-science facility in the state and where she was well on her way to making it the premier agri-science program in our state, if not the country. She brought our science laboratories into the 21st century. She brought us an innovative physics first science curriculum to jumpstart student interest and achievement in science. She brought our beloved planetarium out of mothballs, and, and I think she cleaned it out herself, and made it state-of-the-art preview of a curriculum offering astronomic studies unparalleled in Connecticut. These are all down payments on making our high school the best in the state and our program the best in the state. She ended division amongst us. She eagerly engaged our students, teachers, administrators, parents, communities. She promoted talent, found a lot of talent too. She communicated clearly, transparently, and honestly with our communities and stakeholders. She trusted us, one and all, to do the right thing. She put this district on a glide path toward offering the schools every parent in this state wants their kids to attend. In short, she is responsible for conceiving, birthing, and guiding the progress, hopes, and dreams of this board for every child who attends our storied public schools. The hour's late, and I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop because otherwise I'll be here for three days enumerating the laurels and considerable public respect she has earned in the service of the interests of our children. We will be forever in your debt. Forever. And as I said inside, I want to say for the record, as a native son of Colorado, born there, yes, indeed, cowboy boots have high heels. <laughs> and so when, you, when you're in Arizona um, uh, with your family, uh, don't forget us, because we never forget you. Any further discussion, any words, anyone? I'm done.
We've got a motion on the floor that's been seconded to accept her resignation. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed by saying nay. And all those abstaining by abstaining. John will, John will abstain. So the vote is 11 to 0 to 1. Um, OK. And now for the sake of our children, we have to move on to the next critical order of business. Is there a motion to form a so-called personnel search committee consisting of 12 members, to wit, the members of the Board of Education, Joseph Abdella, John Boniudo, Gregory Cava, Angela Macriarulo, Alex McNaughton, Justin Ongley, Jennifer Pode, Lisa Rausch, Jane Sargent, uh, Julie Stewart, Pete Tagley, and Mary Weber to conduct the search for our next superintendent of schools. Moved by Joe, seconded by uh, Jen. Uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Yeah. Well, we'll see what we can do to zoom you in, or if you can't zoom in, we'll, we'll uh, just have to, uh, we'll be in trouble. But we'll do our best. No, 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 don't worry about it, Jane. That's all right. OK, uh, moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion, hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. All those abstaining, please so indicate. Chairman votes aye. It's unanimous. With no further business to come before us, if there is no objection, we will consider this meeting adjourned by consent at the hour of 9.40. We're adjourned.